think that just because you don't believe in God doesn't mean that you don't want to hear really interesting talks, to think about improving yourself, to sing with others, and then to have a cup of tea with people at the end. I mean, this is really all the best things about church without the one thing which I'm uncomfortable with, which is the religion part. Good morning, Bezel Triple Three. That was Sanderson Jones, part-time comedian who is becoming a fuller-time church planter of what's called the Sunday Assembly. Except in this church, there is no trace of a creator God who is worshipped. Now, don't get me wrong, it is a church. Well, the word church comes from the Greek word ecclesia, which means in its most basic sense, simply a gathering of people who have set themselves apart to discuss the affairs of state. Now, Sanderson got this idea of an atheist church uh, after attending a Christmas service a few years back, and he says this about it. There was so much about it that I loved, but it's a shame because at the heart of it, it's something I don't believe in. If you think about church, there's very little that's bad. It's singing awesome songs, hearing interesting talks, thinking about improving yourself and helping other people, and doing that in a community with wonderful relationships. What part of that is not to like? <laughs> You know, it makes me think that Sanderson could be describing certain well-known worship services today. For example... Yeah, 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 yeah. You've got to have a never Life may throw you some curves. There may be some bumps along the way. But always remember, every setback is a setup for a greater comeback. That difficulty was never meant to destroy you. It was meant to strengthen you. Now, to be fair, Joel Osteen does talk a lot about God. And Lakewood Church, uh, their praise songs do mention Jesus quite a lot. The problem is the God and Jesus that is talked about and sung about bears little resemblance to the God and Jesus of the Bible. In fact, I would wager that Sanderson could listen to one of Joel's sermons and not be at all offended by what he would hear. Anyway, I, I just think it's ironic that what Sanderson is describing as an element of church that he as an atheist loved, sans the God part, is exactly what evangelicalism is slowly but steadily drifting towards. Well, anyways, what is Sanderson's Sunday Assembly all about and how did it begin? Hi, I'm Sanderson. And I'm Pippa. And together we started the Sunday Assembly. It's all the best bits of church, but with no religion and awesome pop songs. It's a celebration of life. And it's not a cult. We started in London in January, and now hundreds meet twice a month to hear great talks, sing awesome songs, help in the community, and share tea and cake. But no Kool-Aid. Now that, of course, is a reference to Jim Jones and his People's Temple in Guyana, where 900 of his devoted followers ended up drinking cyanide-laced purple Kool-Aid in a mass suicide. But the connection Sanderson tries to make here with Kool-Aid and the Lord's Supper as he forcibly gulps copious amounts of grape juice from a gigantic chalice is faulty, false, and factually flawed. It turns out there are loads of people out there who want to live better, help often, and wonder more. And what rational person doesn't want to live better, help more often, and wonder more? I have no problem with those things. The question is, how does a person best do those things, and to what end? There's already one in Melbourne, New York, Bristol, and Brighton. By the end of the year, there'll be 30. That's a 3,000% growth rate. You see, even atheists are not immune to church growth techniques. And at the bottom line, in order to grow this non-religion religion where people live better and wonder more, well... We need your help to build an organization that is 100% dedicated to helping people live better, help often, and wonder more. And we want to give this all away for free, which is why we're asking you for money. £500,000, to be precise. Say what? I know, it's a lot of money, and you probably think we're going to be doing this.
Not necessarily, Sanderson, but sinful human nature such as it is does raise the question of who will end up living better in this new non-religion religion. You can't escape it, Sanderson. It is going to be a religion in the most basic sense. I mean, you're founding a gathering of people who unite around a particular set of beliefs. You even have a creed, short as it may be, live better, help often, and wonder more. Throughout recorded history, humans have gathered together to celebrate their values. So imagine what could happen if we married the best parts of religion with modern science. Imagine if we had the tools to help others and to make ourselves as good as we can be. Imagine if we combined inspiration, technology and community to bring human potential to dizzying new heights in this one life we know we have. Okay, let's cut to the chase. Let's break this mission statement down. So imagine what could happen if we married the best parts of religion with modern science. Um, I think that's been done before, Sanderson. Mary Baker Eddy and the Church of Christ Scientists I beat you to the punch on that one. And it's pretty goofy stuff, too. Imagine if we had the tools to help others and to make ourselves as good as we can be. Make ourselves as good as we can be? That sounds an awful lot like the Mormons who say that we are saved by grace after all we can do. Or put another way, after we have become as good as we can be. Imagine if we combined inspiration, technology and community to bring human potential to dizzying new heights. Nothing new here, folks. The human potential movement way back in the 1960s was super big. It was Abraham Maslow back in 1943 who espoused a theory of self-actualization as the highest human motivation. But we know now that this pyramid is not at all accurate. It's been found that children have higher physical needs, adolescents needed love and self-esteem the most, young adults have the highest self-actualization need, while the elderly need security the most. In other words, the greatest need changes according to age. The pyramid is, in fact, not at all a fixed structure. In this one life, we know we have. Now that's true. Get your human potential on while you can, because in the end, everybody dies. And that is exactly the most important question we as humans have. And that will not be discussed at the Sunday Assembly, whether or not this life is the only life we have. Uh, and... I mean, for me, not believing in God has always been a very positive uh, thing. Uh, a lot of people think that sort of atheism makes the world cold, lonely and dry. But for me, it just makes it richer, deeper and really more wonderful. And so I've always thought of it in those terms. Uh, and, you know, and those are really it's really in the language of religion that I feel it in that sort of transcend in that transcendent way. Richer, deeper, and more wonderful? Such emotion coming from someone who believes that this universe, including you, Sanderson, is no more than the result of random collisions of eternally existing space dust, and that any real meaning and purpose we have in this life is arbitrary and self-manufactured. And uh, so then to me, it's never... I've, I've actually had quite an affinity with religion, because often I would... For instance, when I studied... Uh, the history of uh, Christianity at university uh, as part of my history course. And I would always be able to really, even though you're reading these religious thinkers and you don't degree, agree with where their ideas come from in the slightest, you can still really get caught up in their emotions. And, uh, and so on that side, I always had that affinity. And then about five years ago, maybe even six, I went to a Christmas carol uh, concert and I... You know, I looked around and I thought, God, there's so much here which you could keep and it would still be wonderful. And if instead of having at its centre, you know, a God which for me and many people in the uh, congregation didn't think exist, you'd have something, the world as it actually what is, and the world as it actually is, is perfectly wonderful enough. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that Sanderson likes everything about worship service except the worship part. Now, there are two questions that Sanderson raises here. One, does God exist? And two, is the world really perfectly wonderful without God? Now, let's hold off answering these two questions for now. 
So can you give us a little bit more detail about the whole assembly? Okay, so you guys meet and you, you, you have a celebratory time and you have a sing-song and so on. What, what, what are the wider intentions of this group? Well, uh, the goal is that, well, it really, it's a, it's a three-step goal, is that what we want to do is, you know, we want people to be able to come to it. And from the moment they come to a Sunday assembly, they're going to think, oh, God, you know what? I had a really good time there. It was fun. It was enjoyable. It's a, it's a good way to spend an hour. But after that, you know, we want people to come back and then to try to find a way to have a really massive, positive uh, impact on their own lives. Mm. So that, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to start it is that there's so many things about myself that I want to change. So the wider goals of the Sunday Assembly are to get people to come in, get them to come back, and to have a positive impact on their lives. Sanderson admits that there are many things in his life that he wants to change. And that little confession is huge. What's the problem with you, Sanderson, that there are so many things you want to change? Sounds like you have some sort of standard in your mind of what you should be and that you're not yet. My question is, will living better, helping more often, and wondering more affect the change that you admit you need? And there's no really good place to do it. You know, you either pay a lot of money to go and see, uh, I went to see a life coach for a bit and I didn't really, you know, enjoy what they were about. Uh, and you've got to pay. Not many people can pay. Uh, so on that side, you've got that. And... Uh, so then to begin, it begins with the people coming there. But obviously, long term, we want to then be able to get all of the amazing people in who come to the Sunday Assembly and try to find amazing things for them to do outside uh, with the committee around. And I mean, if you think that already 200 people have got in touch from across the world looking to start their own, it's... Wow. Uh, fun game to play to try to imagine if there were congregations of really motivated people all looking to try to affect positive change exactly what could happen so it's about finding amazing things for the people who come to the sunday assemblies to do you actually think that listening to motivational talks and singing pop songs is enough to sustain people's desire to do amazing things so um just a bit of detail here so it's it's not only a place to have a lot of fun, but it's a place to grow. Oh, for sure. That right. is, uh, I think that uh, a lot of, yeah, I mean, what we want to do, I mean, uh, there's various ways of thinking about this, but one of the people who's involved already is a clinical psychologist. And one of the, she's she gets very frustrated that if you want to use all the sort of best evidence-based, and we're hugely fans of only using evidence-based sort of tips, tools, and techniques. Uh, there's a lot of self-help, which is really just wishful thinking, but we want to make sure that it is uh, evidence-based. Uh, and she got frustrated that you can, if you want to use all that stuff, you can either A, be rich and afford to pay for a psychologist to just help you get 50% better, or B, you've got to be totally insane. Sorry, not totally insane. You've got to have serious mental health issues. Uh, the word insane is not used often nowadays. Sorry, I forget. I've now got a job where I've got to be semi-respectable. It's challenged. <laughs> yeah, so you've got to be have mental health if issues if you want to have one. And so... Where can you go, which is a space in the middle? I'm in total agreement that self-help stuff is worthless. But I would also say that the evidence-based self-help is just as worthless. Uh, here's what I mean. Here's an example of evidence-based self-help. Here's how to identify the critical voice. Belief seems to play an important role here, whether it's believing the critical thoughts or believing the self-compassionate alternative thoughts that you make up in your own mind. This is the kind of stuff that you'll get for free at the Sunday assemblies. Um, I think I'd rather sleep in and listen to Pandora on my phone when I got up. Right. And then not only that, but I think that also, you know, there's a spiritual side to humans. And when I say spiritual, I don't mean like an immortal soul. I mean something very materialist. And by materialist, I don't mean consumerist. I mean of this world. Mm -hmm. uh, and... You know, there is something which needs to be tended to. And uh, I think that is a, a good place for it. Thank you, Sanderson. There is a spiritual side to humans. 
but you don't mean spiritual the way it's most commonly understood. You you mean materialistic, but but not consumeristic, but of this world. What, what on earth are you talking about, man? Spirituality, by its most basic original definition, meant breath or wind. In other words, not physical or material. Come on, fess up. You are admitting that there is an aspect of human, uh, of, of being human, that is not only physical but immaterial as well. And folks, the Bible is where you want to go for the best information on that subject. It seems Sanderson wants it both ways. He wants to, uh, uh, people to attend to our spiritual needs while at the same time rejecting the reality of spirituality. It won't work, Sanderson. And what mm. actually goes on in the service? In a previous conversation, you talked about the kind of music and, um, and, and readings and so forth. Just give us a, 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 a hint of that. Well, there was uh, this week. We it, the thing was all called Lend a Hand, and we had a guy. Our main speaker was from a charity called Inter University, which does mentoring. And so, uh, and that was he's an ex vicar, and he actually launched that from his own congregation. And now it's massive, so it's really inspirational to us. Uh, then, uh, as the theme was Lend a Hand, we had songs on that theme. We sang uh, Help by the uh, help by the Beatles, there was uh, Lean On Me, and we finished with I Need A Hero by Bonnie Tyler. I mean, whose Sunday isn't improved by singing those? Um, I wonder what those three songs would sound like all together. Sorry about that. I, I just, I just wanted to have a little fun. Uh, and then we had a really wonderful reading. Pippa did a bit. Uh, I did gave the address at the end, and it was all a lovely time. And I remember in a previous conversation, you told us that you you sometimes have a readings from Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, we had a reading from Alice in Wonderland. We've had, you know, what pretty much our rule is: anything which is good from anywhere, which might be useful to the people in the congregation we will use. All right, anything good and useful they will use. Now I have to wonder, what is good from an atheist perspective? Come on, let's be clear about this. If there is no absolute standard or lawgiver, and therefore no absolute standard of good, then all you have left is momentary personal preference. As humanist Francis Crick once said, you your joys, your sorrows, your memories, and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. Then we have Richard Dawkins who said this, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Sanderson, come on, you got a fish or cut bait here. Either there is a God and therefore an absolute standard of good, or what you call good, is nothing more than habit and custom, feeling and fashion. And if that's the case, then as Captain Jack Sparrow said, Take what you can, give nothing back. What you're doing with your Sunday assemblies is nothing more than rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. It's keeping a good face on a tragic situation. Don't get me wrong, I too believe that this world is wonderful in many ways, but it's also full of suffering and hopelessness and loss, and everybody dies in the end. Godless church services on a Sunday won't do anything to change that. You're offering nothing more than popular music and trite, simplistic, self-help talks that anyone can get in a million different places in a million different flavors. Why get up, get dressed, and go out on a Sunday morning for that? Can you tell people where? Yeah, so it is monthly in uh, a place called The Nave. It is on the first Sunday of every month. The next one is our service is called Easter for Atheists. 
Uh, we might even sing a hymn. Uh, because uh, we thought, you know, we, 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 it takes place in a deconsecrated church. Ah. Pippa used to go to church. I used to go to church. And just because you no longer believe in God doesn't mean that, you know, 1400 years of Christian history didn't happen in the UK. Think about what Sanderson just said while you watch this last clip. And I think I, I said a, a throwaway comment to, to the excavator saying, you know, well, uh, if it isn't gold and garnet, I'm, I'm not interested. I think a crowd of people had literally just gathered when I started to excavate around the head and I cleaned off this small area where, the, where I saw something shiny. And people say, oh, you know, gold comes out of the ground completely untarnished, but you never, ever believe it. I thought someone had dropped a pound coin in there and they, they were winding me up. First of all, we thought it must be a brooch. It looked as if it was round. As the soil came away, we realised, no, it's not round. It's, it's got indents in it. What could it be? And it was only really when it was finally lifted that we realised that what it actually was, was a solid gold cross inlaid with garnets. Amazingly, exactly what I'd, uh, I'd asked for. Um, and there it was, an absolutely beautiful object. So we had, incredibly, not only a bed burial, but a bed burial with an amazingly rare object within it as well. I've, I've been an archaeologist for uh, approaching 25, 26 years. This is only the second piece of gold I've ever seen come out of the ground. It's rare. So the thing I find most interesting about the, the, the burial itself is the fact that you've got um, uh, one of these pectoral crosses and they are incredibly rare. This is the fifth one that's ever been found. Um, three of the others were probably with female burials or were, were stray finds, we just don't know where they came from. The fifth example we know about was the one found in St Cuthbert's coffin, possibly his own personal cross. So these are artefacts that are explicitly Christian in nature. They would have said, you know, I belong to this new religion. And it was a new religion in, the, in that um, part of the, the later 7th century. So we suspect that um, most of the bed burials we know about were also of this date, later 7th century. Now I would say from what I've read, it's more like the 2nd or 3rd century. But regardless of when Christianity was introduced to Britain, it was not introduced as myth or fable, but as historical fact. And these are the facts. That an early 1st century Jewish man living in Roman-controlled Palestine went around that area preaching good news about the Kingdom of God, performed wonders, got himself arrested and finally crucified on a Roman cross, died, was laid in a tomb for three days, and after that time was seen alive by at least 500 people before his closest followers claimed to see him ascend into the heavens. This man claimed to be the creator of the universe, who first revealed himself to the people of Israel through Noah, Abraham, Moses, and King David. This man, Jesus of Nazareth, claimed to be the long-awaited Messiah within uh, that's found within the pages of the Old Testament and he rose from the dead to prove it. Now to get back to those two questions we raised earlier does God exist and is the world really perfectly wonderful without a God? Jesus answered this first question by claiming to be God in human flesh. He said in John 14 do not let your heart be troubled believe in God believe also in me. Now a good Jewish boy would simply not say that to make oneself equal with God is sheer blasphemy in Judaism, but he did it over and over again. That's why he was crucified. But he conquered death in the grave by being raised from the dead, and he gives that very gift of everlasting life to all who will admit their sins. The many things that Sanderson wants to change in his life, that's what it's really called, sin, and their need of a savior who can save them from their sin and its wretched consequences. When the Lord Jesus Christ is at the center of a worship service, it is there and only there that a person can find real peace and rest and a new heart that wants, out of gratitude for what God has done for them, to give to others in all kinds of helpful ways. The Apostle Paul, who began his career persecuting the first Christians, but then was converted by the Lord Jesus himself, I'll let him answer the second question about this world. He wrote to the church in Romans, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. 
For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we ourselves also, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption or resurrection of our bodies. And Paul continues, he says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom He predestined, He also called. And these whom He called, He also justified. And these whom He justified, He also glorified. <laughs> it's a done deal, you see. Those whom Christ loves, He will bring with Him into the eternal age. Paul continues, he says, What then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ. Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it's written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered a sleep to be, uh, sheep to be slaughtered. But in these things we are overwhelmingly, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other created thing, that includes ourselves, will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. Now that is something I will get up early and go to a Sunday service to hear. You know, finally, I just want to say that the three songs that Sanderson mentioned are very instructive for the reason for going to church. The first one, I need a hero. John 10, 9. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and find pasture. Second one, lean on me. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And the last one, help. I need somebody. Help, not just anybody. Jude 124. Now to him, Jesus, who is able to keep you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. That is what Sunday morning worship is all about. Giving glory to the one true God who deserves it.